Good afternoon from my kitchen in Gloucestershire. I can see that there are some lovely people online and joining us for tea. I have my cup of tea. I have my trusty little silver teapot and I have one of my favorite jugs out actually, the Beryl, it's called the Beryl jug um, from I think it's Woodsware or something. And the green color is my favorite. It comes in green, yellow and blue. So blue is called Iris, which is lovely. So we have today a really exciting guest, my friend, Barbara Salek. She's the co-founder of Waterworks. She's the author of The Perfect Bath and The Perfect Kitchen, which is this beautiful book, which has just come out and all her book tour appointments and schedules were canceled, but it's gone already into its second print, which is really, really great. So I'm going to call Lovely Barbara, um, to the call, I sent the request. Barbara, to come up on your screen, you just have to connect it. And there she is, my friend. Barbara, how are you? Can you hear I, me okay? I can. I'm always so nervous that this is not going to work. But here we <laughs> I have that same thing every day. <laughs> Every time I do this, I sit in the same place and I, I know the Wi-Fi works and if a bird doesn't fly into my kitchen, I'll be fine. It's my little phobia, which happened the other day. A, a, a swift flew into the kitchen and I nearly passed out. I've got a bit of a bird phobia. But you're there. We spoke early on the phone just to make sure that we were on the same date and same page, which is wonderful. And Barbara, I have to start by telling everybody how I met you. So I'm in Los Angeles for LD LDCQ. And I go into your beautiful store and this lady walks up and says, may I help you? And I said, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm from London and I know the London shop and I just wanted to see the, this really big, beautiful, um, I think it was a new, it was just been fitted out. And the lady said to me, lovely, have a look around. These are our new kitchen things. And, and I looked around and it was, and then off I went to my LDCQ thing. And then at the, um, one of the event parties, there was that lovely lady and I said, oh, hello, I've met you today at Waterworks. Um, and you said, hello, I'm Barbara Salek. And I said, are you Barbara Salek from Waterworks? And that was you. And it was amazing meeting you first in your showroom, but not as Barbara Salek, just as part of Waterworks, um, which I'm sure is so much part of your identity. Um, <laughs> since the 70s. Yes, indeed, indeed. If you don't know me, it's really okay. I'm going to help you anyway. <laughs> well, that was wonderful. It was so wonderful. And then we became friends and, I, and you've been to my home for dinner in London. And it was, and, it, and it, it, for me, well, you, you've created a legacy business. And so many of the legacy businesses that we have in our industry, the creators have passed because they are, they are the longstanding um, great companies and but you are you're a creator who's still there still going um, and you created something that will go into further generations and that's really really exciting so your book the perfect kitchen which I held up earlier here it is um, thank you for the beautiful beautiful copy of it has sold out it's gone to its second print even though you cancelled everything we had no choice to be honest uh... <laughs> this is sequestering, isolation, lockdown, I don't know. It's a lot of different things, depending so on... So, Barbara, what's keeping, you, what's keeping you together? You, have, you are always on a plane. You're always somewhere else. What's, yeah. Now you're in Connecticut at home? I am. And admittedly, it was really hard to, to get locked down. And, and it took me a while to find a routine. Um, and in doing so, A, I found company with my dog in my office. Um, and when I have maybe 45 minutes, I go out for a walk. I live in a charming little village on a harbor. And so there's something kind of, of a release by doing that, and it does keep me sane because last year I flew well over a hundred thousand miles, and this year is zero. So <laughs> lockdown, it is. Yeah. yeah. So walking is your thing. And Barbara, you you famously in the book you write that in designing a kitchen, in choosing your kitchen, it's about memories and dreams, and that's what you would encourage someone to do. So. To and what what what, what so to clarify what what you mean is um, for someone to imagine and their, their most evocative kitchen experience and to try and bring that experience before they get into the nitty gritty of 
you know, the nuts and bolts of the kitchen design. What is your perfect kitchen? So, I, I mean, that's a really good question. And there are lots of perfect kitchens. There's the, I mean, your perfect kitchen isn't exactly mine, but the real point of a perfect kitchen is how do you want this thing to feel? You know, it's going to look fine. You're going to have place for your glasses, place for your food. But the fact of the matter is, how are you going to feel when you're in that kitchen? And that's the most important thing. That's the perfect, perfect kitchen. And my perfect isn't yours. And so I said, I said to you earlier, are you there? Yes. Are you no. there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I said to you earlier that we, that I am lusting after your Henry Pot So for those, for those of us who, who aren't, who aren't from the US, I think you should say what a pot filler is. So this is, um, I, if I ever walk it over there, what will happen is I'll lose you. So <laughs> it, it sits above the stove. And so when I'm going to make pasta, this thing sits right on the wall and it has an arm and it pulls out and I fill the pot. So I'm not lugging heavy pots you know, four times back and forth across the kitchen. It just sits there. It's only cold water. And I think it's a magical thing. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I really want one. And I have in my kitchen over here opposite me, a really big blue enamel arga, which is the big Swedish cast iron four oven ancient contraption. And it sort of runs on oil and it's, it really is, it's quite a machine. And it took me a good 10 years of becoming really competent on cooking on the arga. What would you not compromise on? I would never ever compromise on a sink and a faucet. I think they are ultimately the hardest working appliances in the kitchen. Yeah. You must touch that faucet and particularly now wash hands, wash hands. I probably touch that faucet 50 times a day or more. And buying a good sink is a really important thing, whether you opt in the end for a white farmhouse sink or a really high quality stainless sink, without a doubt, I would never compromise on those, both the quality, the size, the design, all of that. I have to say that this is what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say sort of cooker or, you know, there's something a bit more sort of glamorous. Um, mm -hmm. But you're obviously a really practical lady. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think of a really fine sink and faucet, a little bit like a black dress. You know, you can buy one really beautiful one and it will last you forever. You'll feel good every time you put it on. Yeah. Same with your sink and faucet. Fantastic. And how do you avoid mistakes in the kitchen? Okay, the way there's, there really is a method, I think at least for me personally. I start by really collecting images or talking to people who've recently done kitchens. And, and that becomes sort of the baseline. What do I like? What pleases me? But the way you actually stop making mistakes is to hire a kitchen professional. And that's not an interior designer, it's, it's a kitchen professional. Mm -hmm. The interior designer is actually the one who helps you choose the materials and layer the kitchen so it has a very personal feel. But if in fact you just dash right out to the kitchen showroom, when Fantastic. So there's your advice, kitchen professional. Barbara, there's this, there's this image in your book of Jack Lemon in the, apart the movie The Apartment in, I think it was the, the 50s in mm -hmm. New York. And he's in a, what you call a kitchen that a cockroach would be nervous to go into. <laughs> and he is, and he is um, rinsing spaghetti through a tennis racket. Correct. And you say in your book, it's, he's just having a good time. And it's this amazing sort of wooden tennis racket under the tap and he's pulled the pasta on it and he's rinsing it out. And, 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 it's, and it's that quality of experience. Now, obviously we don't anymore really um, have these tiny little room kitchens and they have become this ep epicenter. Um, and so what is, what, what, in, in, your re in all your research, in all of you looking at all these wonderful kitchens, um, what, what is the experience of the kitchen today? And how has that evolved? 
so I, I like to think back to the kitchens of my childhood. Actually, my grandmother had a kitchen that had this gigantic, of course, I was small, so maybe the sink was only medium size, but it was one of the big white things and it had a drain board and there was a big table in the middle. And when it was a holiday, I had two female cousins, an aunt and a grandmother and a mother. And we were like a sisterhood in this kitchen of females preparing meals. And, and here it is a gazillion years later, I still have <laughs> all of that going on. And everybody was, you know, pounding and salting, making and doing. And, and that feeling of community obviously has stayed with me. So the idea of making a kitchen where everybody feels welcome, it's not precious, it's, it's hardworking, but still looks beautiful. That to me is a beautiful kitchen. When, you know, my kids would say, oh, you know, I remember our kitchen when it had a black and white floor, right? And, and so um, the idea that you're going to make memories, that you're going to do things that sort of make your family, your friends um, kind of a, I don't know, they, they just congregate because it feels friendly. It feels really good. I mean, anybody can obviously put up great cabinets. Yeah, yeah, it's that feeling. And the island has become such a huge part of our, our vocabulary and our way of designing and working with kitchens. Um, and you, that, that's obviously got rid of, the island's obviously got rid of the, the traditional sort of prep triangle, which I remember from design college when we, you know, you touch on kitchen design with one of the modules and it's that little triangle. How's that shifted? So, so, in fact, um, the, the island now sort of separates the kitchen in one way or another, and the, and the triangle is now a racetrack oval. So we kind of move around our island, and we can access the sink from the front or the back. Yes. And so it's, it changes the pattern. And that island is where everything happens. It's, it's the center of the kitchen. Yeah. And you, you would think that, you know, there's so many cabinets. I mean, I don't have so many, I have a few, and I have um, counters on either side of the island. My perfect place to work is on either end of the island. I just like, I mean, I don't know, do I want to be the center of attention? I know I want to be in the middle of things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is the middle of things because it's where people come and have a drink um, yeah. and people come and, and talk and people have breakfast. And um, I, can probably, I can probably be sure that when Peter comes to visit you, you'll stand at the island and have a cup of coffee and chat and look at papers or look at drawings or look at work stuff. Um, do, have you found, you obviously have, an, you have mentioned that you have an office at home. Do you find that you're ever working in your kitchen? You know, I started doing that. And the fact of the matter is I got really distracted. I had <laughs> burners and, you know, it was an outdoor fireplace and flowers. And, and it felt to me like I needed to go where I could put my head down. So, and, kitchen and, and so, so, so then you go through, through into your office. Um, yeah. And Barbara, your, 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 what did you learn from doing the book? So, you know, it's interesting in thinking about doing a book. The bath and the kitchen have an alignment, I believe. And in trying to put together a narrative, it was what am I doing here? And what I was doing was creating informed inspiration. And, and I realized that there were so many different places to find inspiration. Um, and it could be from other people's kitchens. It can be in your closet. You know, you may only wear blue. Well, blue is a word color that's yours. I don't really know. But I, I really learned, you know, in thinking about that word perfect again, that yeah. there are so many ways to define perfect. And I, and I learned that actually the similarity between the bath and the kitchen is right out front and center in both you have to install things. So that makes the decision-making process much sort of more evolved. You cannot put tile up on all your walls as I have, and you can see it behind me, and decide tomorrow is the wrong color. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
in the living room, which you can just take to the next tag sale or sell it online, this is a permanent installation. And thinking hard through your color preferences, your material preferences, um, and how to layer them well is, a, is really what I learned. Well, I will tell you that in this book, The Perfect Kitchen by Barbara Selleck, which is on a second print, um, there is a kitchen in this book, which I was shown a number of years ago by a client who had seen it in person. Um, they were either friends or they'd, gone, gone, they'd stayed there. And that she had her own photograph of it. And she was like, that's what I want for my London kitchen. And then I was paging through the book and, and there it was. And it is, you're absolutely right. It's informed inspiration. You know, yeah. and then we made it, we, we, we helped her make, make it work for her um, with, a, with a wonderful kitchen, wonderful kitchen designer based in Somerset. Um, do you have a favorite kitchen in this book? Oh, Justin, <laughs> I can't do that. It would be okay, okay, okay. Do we I like more. No, I, I don't. I mean, I do. <laughs> A couple of them that are sort of off the mark a little bit, and I so wonder. So, what's the craziest? So, so kitchens generally are not crazy. You know, people spend too much time thinking about them to do crazy. But one of the most unusual kitchens is um, it must be in New York City. It's tiny. It's probably as big as my kitchen table. It has a pink glass mosaic backsplash a fancy chandelier, and a pair of tea towels on the front of the stove. They're a pair of rabbits. Like, oh, and the floor is black and white, by the way. So <laughs> it's like this wacky thing. How did this come together? And yet it's fun and it's inspirational. And clearly the person who lives there is lively and, and does things in a less classic way than I might. Fantastic. Somebody's just asked, what is the name of the book? The book is by Barbara Salik and it's The Perfect Kitchen. But it's sold out and it's in a second print. And um, there it is. Somebody's answered the question, which is really, really great. Um, Barbara, everybody is going kind of smart. Everyone's, everybody's you know, device-led and techno-led. And, you know, you can clap and your stove goes on and you can clap and your milk boils and your coffee gets served to you. How does that feature in, in your life? And how does that feature, do you feel, in creating the ambiance of a perfect kitchen? So it doesn't play any part at all in my <laughs> life. <laughs> None was, to be honest. I'm lucky if I can press the thing that says on and off. And I'm good with all of that. <laughs> I am not about technology, even getting on this Instagram with you was like, oh my God, I'm going to pass out before it happens. So I would need an IT truck in my driveway. I like things that simply work and they're not important to me. And yet, if that's something that you love, just go for it. I mean, there's a lot of technology out there. I assume if you went to a kitchen and bath show, you'd see more technology than you know what to do with. So if it's your thing, then do it. My thing isn't that at all. As I said, on, off. Yes, well, my, my Argus got four ovens and they're always on. So there's oh. a baking, a baking, a simmering, a roasting and a warming oven and they're always on and they're all at their own temperatures. And actually everyone, everyone's always scared of an Argo, but you're kind of, you get so used to it and you put things up and then you juggle ovens and you move things around and it's very, very forgiving, I find. Um, but it's, <laughs> But it's, it's not high tech at all. It's just goes, on, it's on or off. And let me tell you, when an arg is off, that it's a huge problem because it's usually on a Saturday morning and there's no one to come and fix it. And it's just off. Off of an arg generally means dead. And until somebody's able to come and sort of clean it and sort it. And you've generally got about 10 people for dinner that evening. Of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have it's never really good timing. Now, for the top about a week ago, my husband invited the, the appliance service man to come and he came to me and he said, well, what do you need to know? Like, well, just show me where clean is. That's all. Exactly. I mean, honestly, I mean, that seems absurd because I have been cooking every night since I have been locked down and that's been since March 3rd. So, yeah. But you, now, Barbara, you call yourself a bee cook. You said if you would give graded in your cooking, you would be, I'm not sure I believe you. But I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. 
I what think, have you been cooking? So interestingly enough, there was a, a supplement in the New York Times, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago. And for some crazy reason, I saved it. And I saved it because it was all about one pot dinners. And they're all in the oven and the chicken goes on and the olives go on and the artichokes go on and some olive oil goes on. And you put it in the oven and you're done. And so, I, I mean, my husband doesn't seem to complain. If he does, he better not tell me or there will be no more meals. Well, exactly. And you've been able to see Peter because he lives nearby to you, your son, Peter, who you work with. Yes. Um, so you've been able to see Peter and his family. I saw Peter. Actually, they, were, they came for dinner. Today is Tuesday. They came for dinner Sunday night. And it was a beautiful evening. And I had this great big thing of oysters. And we ate those outside. And then I made one of my one dish things. And we came inside and ate. And I mean, it was some crazy thing with bratwurst, which I rarely eat. But it was one dish. And maybe Brussels sprouts and potatoes. I love, I love the one dish thing. I think it's fantastic. And Barbara, your schedule, goodness knows, when it opens up, where are you next? Everybody's going to want you. The book's going to want you. The showroom's going to want you. Every, where, are you where, where are you headed first? Do you know? My very first place, honestly, is Washington, D.C., where our son and his family of three children and his wife live. And I have not seen them since Christmas. And honestly, I can't wait to get my arms around them. So that's a big deal. And I must admit, I am a little concerned about jumping on an airplane. Actually, we saw the funniest photograph the other day. Our grandson went out to California to retrieve our granddaughter from college. She needed to get home. And he sent a picture of himself with this great big respirator. And we laughed for half an hour. So, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not heading out too soon. Maybe Nantucket. Maybe. And if, they, and, and, and if, if they can, I'm sure, I'm sure they'll rush up to get to you. Um, I, I hope which, so. We're which would be lovely. Being really, really cautious. Honestly, this is not a time to do crazy things, stupid things, jump out in crowds. I mean, we've managed to stay healthy all this time. And my goal is to remain healthy. Yes, absolutely, and that that is that's something you can't you can't um, you can't stress enough. The front that, the front page of the New York the front page of the New York Times was quite sobering. Was stunning, yes. I, it was so moving and meaningful, and a reminder to stay inside. Yeah, absolutely. I'm headed off to London um, tomorrow for the first time since the 12th of March, and I I I'm not nervous. But I'm, I'm definitely sort of, there's a distance that I'm feeling about, about going. Um, I do need to go, I've got to go and collect post and I've got to, you know, check, just check on the house in London and I've, I, I want to see my team and I want to you know, pop into the office because we're beginning to, we're beginning to sort of open up. And, um, but there is definitely a distance. And, and, um, and my garden, my lady who, we have this wonderful lady who work, who helps us in the garden. And um, she's only been to London three times in her life. And we're in deepest, darkest Gloucestershire. And she said to me, oh, I wouldn't go to London. I'd be too nervous. Um, but I understand from my team in London that it's quite safe. But I've, you know, I've, I've kind of masked up and I'm, you know, I've got my sanitizer and I, you know, I, yeah. I'm prepared, you know, I'm, I'm going covered and I, and yes. I am absolutely prepared. Yes. Barbara, I want to jump back, if yes. I may, yes. 40 years. So... <laughs> I do know that um, your father founded a, a commercial plumbing wholesale business. Um, so that was something you were around your whole life, but in, it wasn't an aesthetic or design oriented kind of um, business at all. And you worked at the Yale University Gallery in 18th century American- Decorative arts. Decorative arts. So furniture, <laughs> silver, um, paintings, you China, and that must all have informed all everything that, that you have put into, um, into Waterworks in the last, in the last four, 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 nearly five decades. Um, how did it happen, Barbara? How did you, how, I mean, you founded, you founded a legacy company. It's, it is, it is such an honor to, 
not only call you as a friend, but to speak to you about this and to share this with people because, you know, people see Waterworks and it's on the, it's on the high street and you, in every big city you drive past and it's Waterworks. Um, but to, to, to encounter a founder, a co-founder like yourself, who's, who's been a visionary. And obviously I do know, I have done my research and I do know that, that, you, have, that you have been a leader. You are a leader. In, in, in the design world and the design world, that's me and everybody else watching and everybody else who will watch and everybody who specifies a faucet and a tap and we owe you an enormous debt of gratitude because you are one of the people who has brought those very everyday things that we touch, as you said earlier, 50 times a day into a very beautiful realm. And it's and it's 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 it's, it's one. How did it happen? It happened. It happened a little spontaneously, in a way, a way of of our moving away from you know a parental business into yes. something much more decorative, and and it was an opportunity. You know, if if you keep your eyes open enough, you definitely will find opportunities. And, and in Europe, there were really decent looking bathrooms. In the US, they were hideous. They were pink, they were avocado, they were maroon, they were all colors. And there's this amazing hole. And we took every dime we had, we borrowed money at outrageous interest rates, and we took a leap. And I can promise you that it did not happen Success did not happen overnight. It was years, literally years. And I started out by, we used to have these telephone books that were called Yellow Pages, and they were business Yellow Pages. And I started with architect and I called everybody, please come in. And they're like, well, who cares? The plumber arrives with his book. He says, you can have this or that. Well, that wasn't what we were, planning on doing. So it was my stubborn streak. Um, it was my evangelical calling to make sure that people would find our business. And, and there was a moment when we took a very traditional faucet and a beautiful handmade pedestal sink and we advertised it. And quite literally overnight, the idea that we were looking at something nostalgic, we were making it current, was the moment at which the whole business turned itself around. So it was interesting to think that you were in, on a path of a modern bathroom, thinking that the, uh, the you know Americans wanted modern baths. What they wanted, honestly, was something that looked old, it looked like it, it was something traditional because just think about the houses that were being built in the 70s. And, and that was the thing that sort of set us on a path that actually allowed us to structure a business properly and, and to make sure that we owned our name, that we owned our image. And, and we didn't really know about things like that. How would somebody who liked our business know about stuff like that. So we learned as we moved along. And um, I think interestingly enough, the day that I realized we had actually done something quite amazing was the day Michael Smith called from LA, here we are in Connecticut, and asked to buy some things. And I went, oh man, we have made it now. And he wasn't even the Michael Smith then that he is today. So. You know, there are lots of little milestones and there are hiccups for sure, as I'm sure Always. we know. And, and part of that is how you self-correct, how you treat your clients. Relationships are really important. How you nurture your staff. So there are just a, a lot of good things along the way that I wished I'd gone to business school. That just wasn't what I was going to do. And, and somehow uh, we, we managed to hold the business together and to make it something that no one had seen before. So again, it was learning as we went. There wasn't a roadmap. And in the early days, where were you, where were you manufacturing? We were manufacturing in Birmingham, England. Wow. And so, 
so you would you would you would design something or find something how did how did that how did the designs kind of how did that happen so i mean i know with the table i can go to the vna and i can get inspired and i can sketch and then i can how does you know there's no vna for <laughs> so so actually what really happened was that we went to salvage yards i don't even really? know knew to do that other than really love antiques. And from our early days of being married, we went out collecting. So a salvage yard was just another place to poke around. And so out in the salvage yards, and I think there, the one particular one that I loved was out in Devon. And yes. there were some crazy looking faucets out there. And we'd only get half because that's all there was or a beautiful handle. And from there, we realized that there were, in the late 1800s and 1900s, catalogs from plumbing houses in France and England. And we began collecting the books. As wow. We, yeah, and so we have this collection of old plumbing books, and we use that as inspiration. And so, you know, you get great ideas, and there are, I would say there are three words that follow us throughout. The words are balance, proportion, and scale. And you don't learn those by just dreaming them up. I learned them looking at teapots and silverware and furniture at the art gallery. And, and when you really get into that, you can apply what you learn from a teapot to a faucet. You know, are there, do things balance out? You know, is the pop-up knob the right size for the spout? You know, you just, you just. And it becomes intrinsic. It does, it does. Because you know, I, I, I'm a bit like that with furniture. I, I can see if a piece of furniture, and there's a company, um, there's a company in London who breaks all the rules and their furniture is so beautiful and I could never design like that. But the, without question, the person who's breaking all the rules is, knows exactly which rules he or she is breaking. I don't know the senior designer there, but I am um, absolutely convinced that they have a classic training because they've done them so brilliantly and so cleverly. It's not just a reinventing the wheel because proportion is proportion is proportion. You know, there are rules of proportion, you know, and, they, and they, they're not often taught enough, I, I, I don't think. Um, <laughs> and Barbara, then you, and then you, 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 you've, 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 you've built Waterworks. Um, how are you guys taking the showroom experience during lockdown and in the future to your clients who will be hesitant to come and touch a faucet that's been touched 50 times that day? That's right. You know, the, we've, we've managed to try to connect with our clients, which is what we like to do and something that we do well. And we're doing it through Zoom. I, I didn't know what Zoom was before March 3rd, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, that's why I need the IT truck in my driveway. <laughs> but, but we are connecting, and when we design things, we always have a We always have a story. So the way that we can connect with our clients is by telling stories about a new faucet, about some terrazzo that we have found. Um, it's an opportunity for us to connect. And we say out loud, you know, this isn't the way that we would normally be doing business. We want you to touch things. That's part of what we do here. Everything we do is, is humanistic. Everything you touch and so you want to take your hands and pretend so we're trying to tell stories so that people connect to what we've designed and so you know we're, we're working on that and every time i do it i think about three more words i say to myself okay was that a good presentation was that a better presentation or was that best and so i apply it to myself and i apply it to the things that we design for our clients and quite honestly good isn't good enough you know that absolutely you know barbara you you obviously have you obviously have a very um strong sense of community because you've created that in your showrooms um you know wonderful katie who runs your showroom in london um does that she's she's she, the the waterworks brand is so strong in, in, in the way she brings things across the way she gathers people together in your spaces and it's wonderful and i imagine that on zoom 
your team there will be doing the same thing and putting that across. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Katie's. I think she's amazing. And I, um, and I think that, but the way, I think she's so amazing because the brand alignment is so good. And, you know, I would take a Zoom call with her if I was specifying Holland and Bartimus because I think that she would get to get the story across to me. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's so important. Barbara, for you, which metal, brass or nickel? Well, I'm going to tell you that I have a mix of both in my kitchen. Now that's a rule people would say, oh my goodness, have you? That's because people get very caught up on the, on the, on the Iron Mongoose. So to just touch on that. And this actually wasn't one of the questions that we said we were going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think um, that, you know, I, I look at the flowers on my table and they're not all the same. You know, I've got some blue flowers and some dark purple flowers and they all mix together. And I feel the same way about my kitchen. I was going to have a stainless steel oven. I have a stainless steel sink. I certainly felt that a matte nickel faucet on the stainless steel sink was kind of a good story altogether. And yet all the hardware is brass. And it feels, it doesn't feel odd. It doesn't feel like, what is she trying to say? Because that's not the way I design anything. It just feels like it fits. So you know, you need to look at your space and think about yourself and think about what works. You know, I, I mean, I... You know, I, the idea that, that you can mix and match things is, it seems to work for me. And that's how you create, I think, you create the layering, you know, um, and all that's those... The and all those mixed elements will, 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 will encourage that and, and add on to that. I do find sometimes you go to these sort of um, newly built houses or spec houses or developer houses and everything from the, 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 the faucets to the um, door handles to the hinges to everything's either, you know, a blackened bronze or it's, or it's brass or it's brushed nickel or it's, and everything's always the same. And it becomes too homogenous in a way. And it, it lacks that kind of layering and personality that things that that that, that things that, that's created by mixing it up a bit because they create a tension between your stainless steel and your brass and they play off each other, don't they? I I definitely think so. I mean, it's like it's like going to a furniture store and buying everything white. Yeah. Not so good. It doesn't say anything about you. It doesn't say anything about the chances that you want to take. It doesn't say anything about, we haven't talked at all about functionality, but to be honest, I think that, excuse me. Not at all. I, that's, that's, I don't know why my husband's phone is on, on my table, but there we go. Um, <laughs> this doesn't say anything about, about how things work together. You know, you do, I just don't want everything to match perfectly. And, and that goes throughout my house. So it's a theme, honestly. You know, we've got some 18th century furniture. and We've got some, you know, like mid-century thing. And the blending is part of what makes something beautiful. It makes it personal. And it's part of the experience. And I imagine your home is a place where people gather. It's not just, just you. Um, I imagine just because I, I, I know you and I know Peter and Peter's the founder of the DLN. I mean, community is so ingrained in him as a, as a, as a human being with, um, with everything that he's done in his, in his, you know, in his career as well as, uh, you know, but the, the, the DLN is the big thing. It's that big community impact and it makes such an impact because it brings people together and it, it makes people talk and it helps people dialogue and it helps. And also, a lot of people will say, well, you know, why do you want to belong to a network like that? And the, for me, the biggest reason and the biggest thing, I, and we're new members, one of the biggest things that I have got from the DLN is, is, is the help problem solving. Because none of the problems are unique. And when you can sit in a call um, with, with, with somebody who, and you can say, yeah, what are, you, what are clients saying about X, Y, and Z? And somebody goes, oh, I had that experience and we're doing it this way or, you know, how are we going to get fabrics? It's wonderful to be able to, to share that load and to be able to, and it's, and, and he must get that sense of community from, from you and Pete, from you, from you. Peter must get that from you. He, Peter is a remarkable networker. 
that he's always had that ability. He, you need to get to know him, but, but creating this community for the design world where there really wasn't a big community has been really important throughout sort of lockdown, isolation, whatever. They have done the most remarkable Zoom calls. Now they've been um, amazing. They have been remarkable. To be honest, I listened to the woman from Indigar um, and somebody else from, you know, what is happening in New York. So they've got their pulse on the whole design industry. And the, the thought is the more the whole industry is together, the stronger they are the more uh, professional it becomes. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that's what he's doing is building this really amazing community. I, I don't think you would hesitate for a moment to call Gil Schaefer in New York and ask him a question because he'd be right there to answer it for you. Yeah, no, and, that is, and, that, and I felt that and it's been, it's been wonderful for us to, um, to, to, for us to have joined and um, we joined because there were, there were so many people were saying, you know, pushing us, not pushing us, but guiding us in that direction. And, um, and they have these amazing, they have these amazing um, groups they put you in. And we have these kind of group calls that you've had during lockdown. And that's really wonderful because they're small and they, they match you up with people where you can, where you can just share, share information and share knowledge and share um, trials and tribulations. And sometimes, you know, somebody on an article just kind of vented some stuff. And that's also it's also necessary because you can't always do that with your team or you can't always do that at home, you know, because, you know, you don't want to. Um, and then, and so that is a, you know, I think the design industry as a whole owes you a huge, a huge round of applause and a huge, um, a huge thank you, not only for, for what you've created with Waterworks and, and bringing um, bathrooms and bedrooms and, and kitchens, bathrooms and kitchens into, into that design realm and, helping create the, the kitchens we know today. The kitchen will never go back to sort of a whole lot of different sort of tiny little rooms that women, as you said earlier to me, women cooked in and called men for dinner. That's, That's not gonna happen again, ever in our, in our time and, yeah. um, and in time going forward. And then of course, for the sense of community. And Barbara, our time's nearly up, but I just, I just want to thank you so much for, oh. I want to thank you so much for being part of part of today and part of my little series, which has been, um, and I know some of your fans, Billy Seglia, he's a huge fan of yours. He's on, he's on, he's on the chat. Um, somebody asked me Thank you. a couple of quick so, times. Um, please, that you is the perfect kitchen. To talk about the well, it's been really fun. Thank you, Barbara. The Perfect Kitchen by Barbara Selling. It's fabulous. Um, and then the other book is The Perfect Bath, which is also really fabulous. It's just a little older and, um, Barbara, thank you so much for your time and stay healthy, stay well, stay indoors. And I hope you get to see the family in DC sooner rather than later. And Justin, you stay well. And this has been really lovely. Nice to see you. I missed you at LCBQ. That's for sure. I know. It's like our anniversary. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I really miss are your fabulous pants. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a, again, that sense of community. But Barbara, thank you so much. Thanks Take so care. much. Bye. Bye.